Today I want to talk about the process of fossilisation. It's important to understand that the distinction of becoming a fossil is bestowed upon very few organisms. The conditions have to be just right. And of course this makes sense. Complete decomposition is the normal end of all organisms that live. If it weren't, vital nutrients wouldn't be recycled into the food chain and there would be fewer and fewer basic nutrients that life needs to flourish. So my point is that fossilisation is necessarily very rare and furthermore, as we'll see, the process is very selective. It favours the preservation of some types of animals over others. Let's take an ocean creature, say a fish, and a land creature. Um, let's use some kind of small lizard that lives near a river. First of all, the creature dies, and it's best if it's buried soon after dying. If it's not buried, then it will probably be torn apart by scavengers looking for an easy meal, or it will certainly decompose if left lying out on the land. In the case of our fish and lizard, maybe a huge flood buries the lizard near his river home and then washes dirt into the sea, burying our recently deceased fish before it has a chance to break down completely. Now, soft tissues, skin and fat for instance, will eventually decompose. Um, but if there is not enough oxygen present to completely break down the organism, the hard tissues like bones, shells and teeth may remain. Already you can see that fossilisation favours creatures with some hard elements to their bodies, creatures with skeletons or shells. Soft tissues themselves are generally not preserved. But we can see fossils of soft tissues that are actually imprints of soft creatures. What I mean is that the body of the soft creature has completely decomposed, but the space left might be filled by sediments. You might say that they are mineral casts or moulds in the shape of the body. So our fish and lizard both have a higher likelihood of being preserved than many, many other creatures that do not have mineralised hard body structures. But after being buried under sediment, the next part of the process is where the fish has an advantage that the lizard does not. OK, so we have our fish and our lizard skeletons both buried under sediment. On land, the tendency, even under sediments deposited by a big flood, is for all of this to continue to erode. The forces of wind and water tend to take away sediments, whereas in the sea, the tendency is to build up the sediments that come from the land. So already, just by virtue of being a sea creature, our fish has an enormous advantage over our land-based lizard in the likelihood of becoming a fossil. So, over millions of years, in order to become a fossil, the remains of the creatures must stay undisturbed, locked away from the forces of decomposition and erosion. But let's say here that the flood was caused by a great geological shift – such as a sudden climate change from a volcanic eruption, and that sediments continue to accumulate over both the lizard and the fish. Now, the next step in the process is mineralisation. Although buried deep within sediments that have continued to pile up, the buried remains will be in contact with minerals around them and in the groundwater. Minerals, especially those dissolved in groundwater, can fill up the spaces in living tissues, for example in the pores or tiny holes between cells of bone. This process is called permineralization, the filling up of the spaces in living tissues with minerals. And this process can sometimes continue until the hard organic tissue is completely replaced by minerals. This is simply called, no surprise here, replacement. So that's easy to remember, but of course there's another technical name for it, petrification. 
At some point, with many metres of sediment having turned the skeletons of our creatures into stone, quite literally, they are now fossils. But buried underneath tonnes of rock, they remain completely hidden. So, there must be one more process that brings these fossils to light. After having sediments deposited on top of it for millions of years, the land around our fossilised fish and lizard must then begin to rise out of the sea and emerge. The geological processes that are always moving and shifting the earth now lift the land to surface where the forces of erosion can wear away all the layers that have built up over time. Only then can we find the fossils. So you can imagine just how many fossils are locked away deep in the earth, never to see the light of day, or how many possibly came to the surface before humans were around and then eroded away to nothing. When someone spots our lizard and fish, now made mostly or completely of minerals, and ever so carefully brushes away the surrounding rock to reveal them, um... This is only possible because there has been a long series of chance events that led to this newfound fossil. Certainly, some creatures are more likely than others to become fossils by virtue of the living conditions in their living environment. You can understand that range is a factor too. That is, if a species is spread over a wide area, it is more likely that somewhere the conditions will be just right to fossilise an individual of that species. And the physical characteristics of the creature make a huge difference in the likelihood of its preservation as a fossil. Harder tissues preserve better. But even with all of these different factors, I hope you appreciate the sheer improbability that any one organism of any type will be buried just so perfectly, become a fossil and then surface again for us to find.